Hello everyone and welcome to We Meet at EMC Digital Days. My name is Lisa Richter and I will moderate this presentation. We are very pleased that you took the time to participate in our virtual conference. The topic of the presentation is EMC Shielding, a practical guide. Our speakers are Adrian Stirn and Victor Martinez. They will hold a presentation and will answer your questions after the presentation. Before we start, I would like to point out one thing. You will be muted during the presentation. This, mean that you, this means that you cannot ask questions during the presentation. Nevertheless, you have the opportunity to ask questions via the chat function. You can find the chat function in the control panel. This presentation will be about 16 minutes long and the chat questions will be answered in the Q&A session following the webinar. There are five to 10 minutes left and a schedule for this. If we are unable to answer all of your questions within this time, um, there's no problem. We will answer them afterwards via email. If you still have un any other questions left, just mail us at exhibition at we-online.com. We will try to answer all of your questions promptly. At the end of the webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a feedback survey. We will be pleased if you take time to fill out the survey and help us to improve our event. You'll receive the link of the presentation in the next few days, and the recording will be available at our website shortly. So now we'll hand over to our first speaker, Victor, and I wish you an exciting presentation. So, hello to everyone. Good morning. And first of all, thanks, Lisa, for the introduction. It was really nice. And now we are going to start with the practical guide, our ceiling. Uh, okay, it is not working. No, okay, so uh, this is the agenda for today. At, at the beginning, we are going to introduce ourselves. Then we are going to jump to some uh, theoretical ceiling basics, things that we need to know before jumping to going a bit more deeply in some uh, shielding experiments and also in some practical and shielding tips. First of all, about us. Well, uh, I'm Victor Martinez. Uh, I'm currently a product manager for the EMC shielding and thermal solutions team. And I started in my I started in the world of EMC uh, thanks to the internship that I did in the cathedra EMC that Worth Electronics has in the University of Valencia. And currently, I'm the product manager for EMC gaskets and also for grounding contacts. So good morning also from my side, uh, here from the World Electronic EMC Lab in our headquarters in Waldenburg. Uh, I'm responsible here for this EMC Lab. Um, I'm doing pre-compliance measurements and customer support, um, focusing on EMC debugging. And so um, I'm doing this since five years after I finished my electrical engineering degree and also get in contact with EMC, of course, uh, before uh, starting up here five years earlier. Um, and one big question we always have is the shielding topic. Um, so customer come to the lab and have a fully shielded uh, equipment, but it still seems not to be shielded as good uh, as we expected. And so this was the idea for this presentation. We want to give you a little bit a practical hint. How does it come uh, um, that we have problems maybe uh, when we go to the lab and how can we avoid it and maybe uh, how can we do troubleshooting? And another big question, of course, that you always have when you work with EMC, what about CE? How does it work with compliance and so on? So since 2019, I'm also uh, in an internal group that is working on compliance topics. But then um, I think Victor will start with our basics um, and I will show you later on the practical things. Exactly, so as Adrian said, uh, first we're going to start with some basics from Shielding, just to have like a bit of background before jumping to the more deeply details. So first of all, uh, what creates the electromagnetic fields or what can create the problems in your system? Actually, uh, anything that it's made of a conductive material can create any kind of antenna, and then at the end it can create some interference or some problems in your devices. Then some real examples about what can create two antennas or what can be two antennas are simple things since uh, cables, apertures, interfaces, or even, for example, heat sinks uh, in the ICs. And then even, for example, on, the, on your PCB, the small vias that you place between the layers and also the ground planes 
and even more and even though the traces can create also uh, some problems in the in the long time now another uh, important point that you need to know before i mean in order to know what is creating the the problem it is the wavelength because with the with the wavelength then more or less you can know which is the dimensions from what is creating or generating the problem and then with that you can more or less guess where is it or what is it then in order to know i mean the wavelength uh, can be calculated with a really simple uh, simple formula which is the uh, the speed of the light c divided by the frequency which is generating the problem for example and then with that you can more or less calculate which is the wavelength or the dimensions from the antenna so some important marks or points is that for example a uh, an antenna can be generating problems since the since lambda or the wavelength divided by 10 until more or less the the length or the wavelength divided by 20 then by divided by 20 it is more or less like the limit where more or less it is generating the problem now all the antennas can be divided in two general groups the first one it is the electric antennas or the electric dipoles and then over here uh, in this group the wavelength uh, the real dimension it is more or less uh, the wavelength divided by two then in order to uh, to have an antenna in this case it is really simple we just need like one length or one uh, piece of uh, conductive material and then we just need a current going from one side to the other one in that case we will be generating an electric uh, field and then the other group it is the magnetic dipoles in this case uh, it is not a length let's say it is more or less like a loop or like like a circle let's say in this case and here the current must be following uh, no must be flowing sorry uh, in the whole radio from the from from the circle let's say and uh, with and these antennas normally they generate like a, a magnetic field instead of an electric field here in this uh, in this slide you can see a chart where let me, okay so i have the pointer here we can see a, a chart where here it is normally like a reference for engineers in order to know what is a, a what is an electric dipole and, and and a magnetic dipole in the near field and also in the far field but what is more, most important about this chart is that uh, for the electric dipoles what we will need for shielding it is something with a really low impedance and then in the case for shielding a magnetic dipole we will need exactly the opposite thing we will need something with a really high impedance so this is more or less just to show a reference that uh, in order to seal an electric or a magnetic dipole we will need exactly the opposite thing now uh, i was saying all the time and i was speaking about shielding sealed and absorbed so all of these properties can be measured or quantified by the shielding effectiveness and then the shielding effectiveness can be calculated by this formula and the formula is the same for electric field and also for magnetic field and then the formula is quite simple and the end it is just a logarithm multiplied by, by 20 also and then the first amplitude that is e or h1 it is simply like the radiation that you have without the seal, the sealing material placed in the inside or in the middle. And then E2 or H2, it is uh, the measurement with the, man, with the sealing material placed in the, in the middle. So as you can see here, if we measure this part over here, it will be just the actual noise or the actual environment. And then once we place the sealing and then we are measuring the, the A2 or H2, it will be actually the difference so by making this formula we will more or less know how much we are sealing it then some basic tips about sealing electric fields as i said before what we will need is some material with a really low impedance and and then once you are sealing it or you're just placing the the low impedance material what it is making it is that it is absorbing the electric field and then the tricky thing is that once we are speaking about magnetic fields it, for shielding them, it is a bit more tricky because then we will have like three different categories. So if we're speaking for low frequencies and then with low frequencies, I mean like speaking in Hertz, there we will need a high permeable material, like for example, the Mu metal. And then in the case that we are jumping to medium frequencies, then we will need to start to play with the skin effects from the conductive materials. And then 
in the cases where we are speaking about gigahertz, we will need to play with the permeability from the material, so with the mu prime and then with the mu double prime, so with the reflection and the absorption from magnetic materials in this case, for example. Just making a summary from everything, then the basic thing is that if we if we want to seal or we want to seal the electric field, we will need a low impedance material, and then if we want to seal a magnetic mat, uh, field, we will need a high uh, material with a high permeability. And then the ideal case for the sealing will be that it, the, well, the ideal sealing material will be a material which is able to seal electric and magnetic field. But also the good thing is that it has to be as thick as possible. So having this rule, you need to find the best material which will suit with your uh, application. And now we can jump for some theory for real applications, like for example, something that you're going to find everywhere in your devices, which is at the apertures. So all the devices nowadays, they are just going smaller and also they are working at a really high frequency. And that means that they need some ventilation. And with that, I mean that we will need some holes. And also, even though if they are, if the devices are placed in houses or in housings with, let's say with two pieces, so the main frame and also like a lid or like a cover, that means that it is not like a perfect box. And that means that we are going to have small gaps over there, meaning that that, that will create some problems. So, but uh, jumping to the, one of the main issues for mechanical engineers, it is, uh, what do I have to do with the apertures? What do I have to do if my system needs to be ventilated? So in those cases, one thing that you need to have in your mind all the time is that the, if you want to have some ventilation holes, then the important or the more crucial, let's say, spec who is going to affect directly to the performance of the ceiling from the housing, it is the linear dimension. And with that, I mean like, for example, the length or the height from the hole, let's say. With that, I mean that, for example, as we see here, this lid or this hole or yeah, or in input will create more problems than this one, despite that they have the same area. The reason is just because the length here, it will create a dipole. Meanwhile, this area, the dipole that we create, it won't be as problematic as this one. So one thing to keep in your minds is that the area, it is not crucial, meanwhile, the length and the height it is it. So as I said before, if you, for example, also have like a really big area to cover or just to remove this, uh, the material for there just for ventilation, an alternative that you can do or you can have is just to create like really small windows over here. Because then also there is a correlation between the number of holes and the performance from the housing in DB, which can also which can help you in order to know how much or how many holes or how many divisions you can use or how many divisions you cannot use. And now Adrian will actually explain to you some real applications which will apply all the ceiling theories uh, that we just uh, presented now. Um, we will go on with a small experiment. Um, and the idea behind this, um, someone wrote that he cannot see in full screen. Maybe I remove my camera. Maybe then it's easier to see in in full screen for your on your application. Um, so we will go on with a small experiment um, where we can can get a feeling um, how uh, the shielding works in real life and how uh, it looks like uh, when we do the radiated emission measurements, for example. <clears throat> and the idea behind it, why we show these slides, is uh, we have some uh, uh, misunderstanding between mechanical engineers and electrical engineers. Often, often you work in the same team, but you don't uh, understand each other. And this could cause to some issues when we go for the final product. Um, yeah, uh, the, the most important thing is that we understand each other when we work in such a mixed team and that uh, mechanical engineers understand what we as electrical engineers need to pass uh, the EMC test and uh, to have a good shielding. Um, also, maybe we as electrical engineers uh, need to understand uh, that we cannot change everything in mechanics and that we have to follow some rules, but therefore it's important that the other uh, part is understanding uh, where we have to uh, what what kind of things we have to be take care for. 
Um, here in my lab, uh, I created some small experiment. Um, I've added a comp generator uh, inside a shielded box, and we want to uh, understand this uh, comp generator as our noisy electronic that we want to shield now. Um, we have a vertical antenna on this small uh, comp generator here, and we are also measuring with the log periodic antenna in a vertical polarization. Um, the measurements are performed in my anechoic chamber here, um, and the results uh, you can see here. So this is the box opened with the electronic active. Uh, we have 20 megahertz harmonics. So we can see starting here at 30 megahertz, the first harmonic is starting here, 40 megahertz, 60, 80, 100, 120. And as you can see, the electronic seems to be quite noisy. Okay, yeah, it's a comp generator. That's uh, how it works. And we see we are 30 dB above the limit. So now our conclusion is we want to shield this um, to reduce the radiated emissions. Um, at first, I will use some barbecue aluminum foil, uh, how, uh, as you can buy it in every supermarket. Um, I wrap, them, wrap the foil around um, the box, and at the side, I connected it, you can see it here, with copper tape, with a conductive uh, adhesive. Um, the aim is to have a fully screened uh, device without any uh, slots in the enclosure. And you can see uh, we reduce the noise dramatically. It's about 60 dB at this point here. Um, and then we are in the yeah, noise level of the measurement system. So we cannot measure below this uh, line here. This is defined by our measurement equipment. Uh, you can see also we have some very small slots as it look, looks like here. Um, I'm, I haven't worked that yeah, clean and so we have maybe a few millimeter slots that create some issues here, but of course we have a good attenuation. So these are all uh, the red lines will be the measurement uh, without uh, the aluminum foil um, as we done it before and then uh, the green line will in the next slide always uh, the change we do. So of course we cannot use um, this uh, equipment then in the field even, um, because normally we need some openings to put in cables or to have our radio communication and so on. So at next thing I will do is I will drill a hole into my enclosure in the experiment. I'm just using a, using a cutter knife uh, and do a small hole here. Then we do again the measurement and we can see that if we add this small hole, um, we don't have an increase in the radiated emissions when we go up to one gigahertz. So this is working quite well and we uh, can say um, if we add these uh, holes and we take care on the lambda divided by 10 or divided by 20 rule, it works fine. Then at next uh, we put in a cable. I'm just using a laboratory cable. Um, Four millimeter banana cable. I do not connect it in the inside to the uh, to something. It's just hanging in the uh, enclosure in the shielded box. Um, and then you can see the noise is rising up, um, and more or less the shielding is not working anymore. So now we have an antenna coming out of the shielded box that is putting out a noise from the inside. Um, here it's quite important. If we add interface cables or power cables to a shielded box, we have to add a filter at a point where we enter here the shielded box. Or we have to use shielded cables that are 360 degrees shielded and uh, with a right geometrical termination. So the next point is uh, heat. Uh, you get problems uh, if you have a closed box without any ventilation. Uh, electronic heats up, so we need ventilation holes. Um, I uh, added more uh, holes here with a cutter knife, um, and we can see if we add a grid of holes that are small, we don't get problems in the emissions. So this is, uh, as mentioned in the basic uh, part before, and it works in reality. And finally, I've added uh, some slots. Um, the slots are about 20 centimeters in length. Uh, and you can see we go up with the emissions. And so the shield is not working anymore. Um, sometimes we need slots for Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, but then we have to cal calculate the length that it fits uh, to the wavelength we want to that we want to have to pass uh, the shield. Um, and they must be small enough that the noise is not coming out or going in. If we need ventilation, we should go 
to the holes and not to the slots. Um, and we have also to take care if we connect uh, different parts, uh, metal parts of the enclosure, that we don't have these slots. So this can be due to geometrical problems or due to non-conductive paint. So the conclusion of the small experiment is uh, it's quite easy to see uh, if we have a full shielding and everything is connected without any slots, uh, the attenuation is quite big, even with just aluminum foil. This is working quite good. Um, it's important that we uh, connect the interface cables that are shielded uh, fully to this uh, chassis. And it's quite important uh, that we filter the relevant frequency range if we have uh, some cables passing the shield and penetrating the shield. When we do ventilation, we will avoid slots and we will go uh, to the drilled holes and uh, take care on the lambda divided by 20 rule if we drill the holes. And we have to take care that if we uh, put together different metal parts that we don't have uh, slots by paint or by geometrical problems of the enclosure. And then we go to the EMC lab and we will do the measurement and maybe we fail again or we have problems. And then the question is what can we do? Yeah, we have seen we can use aluminum foil, wrap around everything and then uh, more or less uh, we should have some attenuation. And this is what I want to show you now. This is from a customer project uh, from this year. We checked and so we had some geometrical issues in this product um, and we started to put aluminum foil around and uh, to terminate everything to fulfill the rules we discussed earlier and now maybe we have a look on the critical parts the first thing is we wrap aluminum foil around but we have also to be sure that the uh, slots that are created between the different aluminum foil layers are, term uh, are closed and therefore we use copper tape you can see it here <clears throat> also we have a lot of cables leaving the device on the test here, for example, we have Ethernet or we have some shielded cable and some shielded power cable. Um, here we have to check that everything is connected in a good way. Also, we have the slots where we uh, add these shielded uh, inputs. Here I terminated aluminum foil also with copper tape to the backplane. So uh, more or less the part of the backplane is part of my shielding. Um, Sometimes we have bad cables. Um, Lee Hill yesterday uh, gave us a very nice presentation and he showed us also uh, a bad video cable. Um, I also had this example in the lab and then I opened up the cable itself on the backside because here we had a pig tail. This, isn't, this wasn't working quite good. So I removed the isolation of the cable shield and then I connected uh, some of this conductive uh, textile tape. I wrapped it here with a cable tie to have a pressure on the shield and then I shielded it, the cable externally till the connector part and here I connected the shield to the side of our device under test also um, inside the connector. So um, we have to take care if we do these experiments that we uh, shield everything and don't miss something. And um, if we have cables leaving, we have to take care that they are filtered or that they are fully shielded. Um, of course, we cannot sell this product like this, but it's a, a more or less a way to understand where noise is coming from. If we still have noise and everything is done perfectly, maybe our auxiliary equipment that we use additionally, you don't see it here, it is on the floor, is creating noise. I strongly recommend to check auxiliary equipment before doing such things, of course. Yeah? So we first check auxiliary equipment and then we go this way. So um, the red uh, emission is from this device. You've seen in the pictures before uh, without the aluminum foil and emissions and the green one is after uh, we add uh, cable ferrites on not shielded cable and add the shield. So. Um, now we can start to remove partly uh, the, yeah, some, some of the measures. Maybe uh, the noise is coming out from the device under test and not from the cable. So we can remove here the filters or we can uh, remove parts of the shields and so on. And then we understand how we can solve the problem later on. Also, uh, we should have a look on uh, if we have such issues with uh, shielding. 
where can it come from? Here we see a shielded box, um, but this will not work because both parts of the shielded box are not connected in a good geometrical way. You can even see through this slot here. And if you can see through a slot, it is not RF tight, of course. But this slot can also be non-visible uh, if we have a non-conductive tape or something like this. So if you can see a slot, um, you should remove it. You can remove this slot by a gasket or by a copper tape. And also take care on painted slots. Um, some words to the copper tape that we all often use in EMC labs. The copper tape uh, and aluminum tape and also the conductive tape here from conductive textile that is more flexible. Uh, all tapes have this uh, adhesive that is conductive, but the adhesive itself is not conductive. It contains uh, some conductive bubbles and we need a high pressure to connect copper tape uh, via this conductive to the conductive surface. Make sure that you do give it some pressure here, that you have a good connection, and then it's electrically fine. But take care if you use copper and aluminum tape, if you give it pressure with the fingers because uh, you have razor's edge here, and you can cut your fingers. Take care, I recommend to use some protection gloves here. And now I will hand over uh, to Victor. Uh, and he will show you um, he will show you how uh, to implement uh, some measures uh, in your product um, without aluminium foil because the aluminium foil uh, is fine for experiments, but then we have to turn from the uh, EMC lab debugging into the product that we use in the series. Exactly. So. As Adrian said, the aluminum foil and well, all the conductive adhesive tapes or all the EMC tapes, normally they are just like a lab solution instead of a mass production solution. So in the case that you need to cover any kind of slot, uh, cover, I mean, the interface between the cover and the frame from the uh, sling houser or any kind of slot that your device may have, one of the easy solutions is just to place over there a conductive fabric cover foam gaskets. So like in, in the case of our standard WELT, uh, once you are placing it in the middle, so here on, on this picture on the left, we have a picture about what could be uh, the connection between a frame and also the cover from this from a housing. And then even though that we think like, okay, it is super smooth, then there are not any kind of mismatch between the top and the and between the cover and the and the frame from, from the housing. There are over there because if you just analyze them with a microscope, you will see like these tiny small gaps. And then in the long time, uh, as Adrian said, they can create like a really big issue in speaking in terms of EMC. So as I said, as I said before, just placing over there a EMC gasket like the conductive fabric cover phone or our WELT will just uh, solve all of these kind of issues because then the foam, uh, which is the conductive fabric, which is wrapped along the foam will just mold it to all these tiny gaps and then they will create a perfect connection between top and bottom. Then also there are different type of connections between the housing and yeah, in the housing, sorry. And then for that, we have different profiles for the foam and for the conductive fabric, which is wrapped around it, meaning that we can directly, or it is possible to fit any kind of connection or compression connection that it is needed. Also another important point about the MC gaskets that uh, must be half all the time in your mind. It is that uh, there is a tumor rule that the gasket should be compressed all the time around a 20% from the original height. The reason behind that it is easily or a mainly just to create like a full connection between the top layer and the bottom layer because then the gasket will be wrapped and compressed, so meaning that it will create a whole connection over the adhesive tape. Then, as, as Adrian said before, in the case that you want to sit the cable, you have to take care about where you're placing it or where are you making the connection. Because normally, uh, one of the most common, well, one of the most problem, no, most common problem, sorry, that can happen is that probably the housing it is painted with a non-conductive painting, meaning that directly you will not have a, a grounding connection uh, from the cable to the enclosure, meaning that that's an antenna. Then also in some other situations where the material from the housing it is a bit sensible because it can be, for example, magnesium or aluminum. In most of the cases, uh, 
customers try to an audit just to make it more rough against environment. And then at the end, you are just creating an oxidation layer between the housing and also the connection from your cable or the connection from your shielding, meaning that you are you are just creating, I mean, you are not co making a grounding connection and then you have an antenna over there. Then also in for the cases where you just place everything and then everything is how is grounded and then you just place your device in the outside, be careful also with the, with the oxidation because it can create also some problems because between the interfaces, you can have some ox some oxidation in the gasket or even the, in the housing, meaning that at the end, the ceiling won't work anymore because oxidation, it is one of the big, it is like the main enemy for uh, EMC shielding EMC for housing. Then, as I was speaking about corrosion and about oxidation, uh, the main enemy that we have here, let's, uh, it is the galvanic corrosion or the galvanic compa compatibility. So uh, the main thing is that all the materials can be, uh, yeah, can be listed about how novel or how base or I mean how cathodic or anodic are the are the materials. So you can find uh, in a huge amount of different tables on internet. But then one of the main tips or one of the main things that you need to think about selecting the correct material is that uh, the materials must be as close as possible and then. Uh, an anodic material, like for example, in this case, magnesium, which is a really common choice for mechanical engineers, due to it is uh, it has a low density. Uh, as anodic they are, or are close to yeah, uh, as are close to the bottom that they are, that means that they are really anodic, and then that means that they are really sensible to oxidation. Meaning that, for example, magnesium will get or will have more probabilities to get oxidated than, for example, in this case, gold or platinum. That's the, first, that's the first thing that you need to think. And then the, set, the second thing is that in order to choose the materials which are going to be connected, they must be as close as possible. And then with that, I mean that if, for example, if we have a, an aluminum cover, let's just select this one. Uh, if you select, for example, um, let's say a beryllium copper gasket, then you will have a really mismatch or a, or a diff or a big electrical potential charge here and then in the long time if the device is going to be placed in the outside for example or even in a non-controlled environment in the long time you're going to have corrosion over there meaning that in if for example you have aluminium and an aluminium housing which is also really common alternative for mechanical engineers the best thing will be to choose um, an aluminium uh, gasket which for example our WELT can be customized just to change the conductive fabric over foam for aluminum foil, meaning that if you choose that kind of gasket for your aluminum enclosure, you will have a win-win situation because you will have the same material and then the corrosion will be, the risk of having galvanic corrosion there will be uh, minimized. Then also another common application is it is about displays. So, uh, if you want to seal that display, you have to re you have to be careful because maybe first of all the connection on the bottom from the from the display like here can maybe just have like a tiny connection over there, so it is recommendable to place a EMC gasket there just to have a better connection. Then also maybe on the bottom you will have some non-conductive material like a like a pet film or like a plastic material just to avoid like any kind of scratch to damage the, the display. So be careful with it and then check if you have it because if you have it, you will have to remove it. And then also in the case that you are going to place the, the display, be sure that you have more than one connection just to, again, to reduce any kind of EMC, uh, EMC problem or to remove any kind of slot. And now Adrian will give you some uh, some basic tips about pigtails. So yeah, let's go back to our shielded cables. Um, Lee Hill showed us yes showed us yesterday uh, some video cable with a pigtail, and I have found um, a USB cable with exactly the same behavior here. Um, I opened it up because our emission were quite high. And I started to open up the cable here, and it, this looks quite fine. 
So we have a lot of uh, material for shielding. The cable is quite thick. It looks quite high quality. But then the manufacturer here started to uh, create a pigtail with the shielding material that we have here and soldered it um, to the connector. Then they filled up um, with some of this plastic glue and then they put over a copper shield. And as in the video cable yesterday, this copper shield is not fully connected here to our um, shield that we have on the cable. And so this is more or less a not shielded cable. Um, and I think I uh, will come to the first question that I've read out in our Q&A thing. Uh, someone uh, was asking if you follow all the shielding rules, should you ever need a ferrite on a shielded cable? No, normally you don't need a shielded cable if everything is closed and controlled. But here, as we can see, we have an opening and for cables with bad connections, uh, of, uh, then sometimes uh, ferrite is used. And so normally if everything is fine and you, we follow all the rules, we don't need ferrites on cables. Um, that are shielded. But here in this case, um, we have a penetration of the shield and it's not working anymore. And this is why uh, then uh, ferrite might help. Um, so how should a shield of a cable be connected? Um, I have some example here from uh, my lab. Um, I'm producing my own antenna cables that I'm using here. Um, and here you can see uh, the shield and it's terminated 360 degrees around uh, our connector and then crimped here. So this is the best connection and this is something we normally want to have also for uh, communication cables that are shielded. So here it's quite important to really take care. Um, and Victor can show you uh, how we can solve these uh, things uh, with our equipment because of course uh, we also have some uh, shielded material uh, where we can connect it in this way. Exactly, so as Adrian said, uh, what can we offer to, to you in, in order to solve the EMC problem for cables? So for that we have actually a combined solution which is first our WEST, which actually it is just like a knitted wire mesh or of a conductive material, which is, if I remember correctly, nickel plated copper. And then what you will need to do is just to combine it with, for example, one of our WEEL, which is just an earthing belt. And then just by creating uh, an electrical connection like here, then you will have your cable fully shielded. Also, it is recommendable just to have as many grounding points as possible, just to avoid any kind of issue. Then also another important point is that don't paint before placing it, or don't use like any kind of uh, non-conductive paint uh, paint before, be because you will create again the isolation layer, meaning that you won't have there the electrical connection, and then also meaning that your ground your cable won't won't be grounded. Then another alternative that we have for solving shielding problems, it's our ferrite sheets, which actually, as our colleague uh, Adrian uh, presented, I think it was yesterday uh, we, actually the ferrite seeds can be placed in or can be used in different cases like for example you can just stick it directly in your closure and then it will be absorbing noise then also you can just use it in the data lines just to filter a bit the signal and then or even though you have like a UPCB system you can just place it in the nearby the source just to have the maximum uh, shielding effectiveness and then with that you will be absorbing some noise from the source and which won't affect the victim. Then also one of the main issues that we got recently is that as I said before, our the devices each day are becoming smaller and also they are working in higher frequency, meaning that they need some heat sinks of some kind of thermal management. At the same time that they need some EMC solution. So for that we just came out with a WE fast thermal conductivity or fast TC as we call it and then actually it is just like a ferrite sheet which also has the capability to have some thermal conductivity or to transport the heat from the ice in this case to the uh, heat sink and then uh, this is due to uh, it has some ceramic particles inside of it and then it grants it the, the property to transfer the heat also an alternate a good thing about this kind of ferrite sheet is that normally the 
the standard ferrous sheets are limited by the adhesive and also by the PET layer in some cases, meaning that the working temperature normally is around, I would say, 100 degrees or even lower. And then with these ones, as you can see there, it is post it, as you can see here, to be more accurate, they can work up to 160 degrees, making it the perfect option for high, high temperature applications. Then also in the case that you already know where is the uh, where is the antenna, or you want just to directly seal the, your IC or a section from the PCB, uh, we have the sealing cabinets or sealing cancels, or as they can be also named. Then uh, here for the sealing cabinets, we have two alternatives. We have the standard HHC, or also we have the seamless variation. So the material from both of them, there are exact. It is exactly thin plated material, and then. Uh, the only thing is that you need just to solder it to the ground plane, just to have a full grounding connection into your PCB. And also the main difference between them is that uh, the standard SHC, uh, due, to the, uh, due to how they have to be produced on the corners, they, they don't have a totally seamless solution. So that means that the material is bended and then just grab it to be close, as close as possible meaning that they are able to offer a good sealing effectiveness up to three or five gigas more or less, depending on the application. And then for the recently applications like IoT, 5G, or even the new standards that they are coming out uh, for the industrials, uh, we can offer the SHG seamless solutions, which as the name say, they don't have any kind of seamless on, on the corners, meaning that they can they are able to offer a good ceiling effectiveness up to 60 gigahertz, which are the new uh, standard coming out. And also at the same time, in the case that you need some ventilation holes, our cabinets can be produced just to have some kind of a ventilation array, meaning that uh, you will be able to allow to breathe your devices inside of the cabinet. And then those holes, they are not going to lower your ceiling performance. Now, uh, my colleague Adrian will explain to you how to implement some sealing. I have to accept the screen sharing. Okay, um, so uh, last slide for today. Um, how do how can we implement some uh, shielding measures in the final product? We started up today with some aluminium foil, and of course, we cannot use it later on um, because we need some uh, holes. We need also a product that can be produced by the manufacturing department and here i want to show you some ideas how this can uh, be done so um, here we have an embedded computer with some uh, touch screen on the other side here you can see the display backlight and um, it, uh, we have more or less two parts that need to be connected we have this back uh, part that is screwed here and we have the front panel where the computer and the display is in and um, the product failed uh, emissions testing, and the question was why. So we started up, put everything in aluminum foil, checked the interfaces, video cables, and so on. Um, and finally, we had uh, here a very big slot um, between uh, the computer part and the display part and the back plane. And this was because we have some uh, non-conductive tape here. So um, in the next step, after removing everything from aluminum foil and so on, um, we scratched up the paint and then add the conductive gasket. And so this is a solution that you might use uh, in mass production. You just um, add some uh, tape before painting uh, the cover of the device, um, you remove uh, the tape after the painting, and then you add a gasket. And so you have the chance to get here an RF tight slot. That's quite nice and a solution that is working for uh, for the mass production. Another customer of mine is producing his own uh, housing. And here uh, he had a problem that he had long slots and he's using uh, this textile tape for closing it. So this is maybe also a solution. Sometimes this textile tape is also used to connect display back planes to ground plans on PCBs and so on. So this could be also a solution that you might use. Um, and finally, we have the Do Your Shield um, uh, kit to, um, where you can create your own shield uh, with this tin plate and you can solder it to the PCB. So if you cannot use aluminum foil, maybe this is also a solution to get some shielding planes 
or some uh, capacitive uh, shield planes to prevent noise from coming out or controlling loops. So all three examples from the lab and solutions that might uh, work later. Normally, you don't want to use this in mass production, but uh, you can contact our shielding guys for uh, for solutions, or it's uh, possible to get some mechanical solutions then. So then, uh, we like to thank you for joining us today, and we go to the Q&A session. Um, then I can turn on my camera again. Because now uh, we have the little little guy here. I think you should see the screen big enough with video. So maybe Victor is also joining us. Yep. So. Yes, thank you very much, at first, for your presentation. Um, just one mark from my side. Um, if anybody wants to ask a question via microphone, just raise their hand and we try to unmute. Um, otherwise, just fill in the question in the um, panel at the right. So um, I think we answered the first question with the ferrite during the presentation. And now I have a question due to my experiment. OK, um, the question is, uh, is the first DUT an antenna? Yeah, so um, I was in, in my presentation break outside and put uh, this generator. It's a, it's a comp generator and I used it as an example for a noisy electronic. In this case, I did not want to show uh, uh, some, some RF communication system that's inside a shielding. This is just an example for some noise source that we can shield something. It's easier to use uh, for experiment such a generator than to set up an electronic device, of course. Um, and I think this, it, what comes with the question is um, that uh, maybe we need some openings for communication. And yeah, that's right. But in this case, we have to calculate the opening um, and we have to think of how big can this opening uh, by wavelengths so uh, that uh, slot we create only uh, is used for RF communication and um, that the noise that we want to shield is not coming out of this slot. So this is something we have to calculate. Then also I can see that there is a question regarding with chase. Why is it important to connect the ceiling to the chases and uh, what is meant with chases on your application? So yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, maybe uh, that was misunderstanding. In this case, chassis and shielding is the same because it's one box. Um, it's important that we connect everything to a box. Exactly. So the main purpose is just to have everything connected, just to have just a full or just one device, on, or to don't have like two sources. Let's say in that way. So it's just to have one block. So um, then we had a question to uh, slide 28. I return to the slide. Um, uh, why is it damping some high frequencies? Yeah, this is depending. Uh, we have some uh, complex field situation here and we have overlays. So we have a lot of slot antennas and then we have waves and we can have um, uh, maximas and minimas depending on, on which position we are measuring. Uh, and so this is some overlay over the different uh, single slots in the far field. So we can have minimas and maximas, of course. Then another question, which it is quite interesting, is where uh, where to connect the shield of the cable in the case of a plastic connector, and then it is feasible just to connect only one termination to the ground plane of the PCB. So first about the plastic connector, then there I think Adrian can answer it because he will face it like almost daily in real applications. <laughs> Yeah, so this is uh, quite not so not not so easy to understand uh, to to answer. Uh, it depends. So uh, if we have a plastic connector, the first thing is: do we have a shield in our device? 
because I can, uh, for example, use a shielded connector on a PCB that is used open. Uh, if you let me jump out the chamber, I can show an example. We have it here. We do some evaluation boards for a single pair Ethernet. And here, for example, we have a metallic connector on a PCB, but we don't have a shield. So uh, we don't understand this as a shielded uh, PCB. We can use a shielded cable for returning common mode noise, but the PCB itself is not shielded. So if you use a plastic cable with a plastic connector and there's a shield connected, at first it's not a shielded cable because the shield is not connected to the connector. And the second question is, uh, when we connect it to the ground, do we have a shielded device? In, from my understanding, we have a shielded device when we put it inside a shielded box. In this case, we can use the shield as a common mode return path. But we would not speak of a completely shielded device in this case. Mm -hmm. Maybe this answers the question. If not, maybe we can talk later on by phone or something like this, because I think this is a longer topic. And then another one is, what is the best connection for electronic shieldings when soldering is not an option? It is the flexible tape or the adhesive tape? I know, uh, and they asking if this is adhesive. Is this adhesive? So I will say that the, in the case where the soldering is not an option, then the best thing will be just to try to create your, yeah, just to use any EMC tape like the copper or the aluminum, depending on the corrosion that you may have. And then in also about the mechanical restrictions, about how flexible it has to be. Because if you need like a really flexible, just to try to fold it or just to mold it to the actual device or the actual connection or surface, then maybe the conductive fabric, will, it will be the best option. And about the question if it is adhesive, yeah, uh, the thing is that it, the bottom surface, it is made of a conductive pressure sensitive adhesive, meaning that once you are just compressing it or just to roll it a bit, just to have, just to ensure that it is connected, then uh, I can guarantee to you that the tape it is already like attached. I think the best solution is to, to use uh, 360 degree fixation and screw it to the, to the shield where we enter the, the shielded box, because this is maybe uh, something that uh, will, yeah, be in high quality for a longer time. Yeah, but this is a mechanical question again. Mm -hmm. Then the last question they say, is it better to use an unsealed cable to go inside of the enclosure or is it better to use a shielding cable which may have a big tail? <laughs> so, <laughs> One is bad yeah. as the other, right? <laughs> so um, when we use a shielded cable, we need a shielded cable without a pigtail, 360 degree uh, termination. And we have, when we have a not shielded cable, an uh, unshielded cable, uh, we need a filter. So this depends what is available. And I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, again, the question with the ferrite on the outside of a shielded cable. Yeah, again, so the an, an ferrite on a shielded cable is only helping if we have problems with the shield, maybe by a pigtail or something, some shield penetration that we don't know. If we have a full shielded system, the noise should be inside. And we shouldn't get problems uh, when we do EMC measurements. Um, and question, shielded power line cables, uh, uh, this depends. Um, when we have a shielded power line cable, then we also need a shielded box where it comes out. We cannot use a shield that is only terminated on the device on the test side. So maybe it makes sense to use a 230 volt AC cable or something like this with a filter when we uh, enter the shielded box. Then what would you recommend as a material for soft for SMT shielding? So there that will fully depend about two conditions. The first one, it is which product are you going to use? If it is a shielding cabinet, then you can just jump on or go for thin plated materials because it is really easy to solder it. But then in the case that you are going to face on environmental issues, like for example, a really humid 
humid uh, environment, then the material from the cabinet will have to be a nickel silver material just to have some extra protection against the, the humidity and then to have less corrosion in the long time. And then in the case that, for example, you want to use a contact finger or a contact spring or a contact spring, sorry, then the best material will, I will rec personally re recommend the gold plating because then it is like the all terrain plating again, which will allow you to have a good contact and a good connectivity between with any kind of material. And then if we are speaking about the EMC gaskets, then it fully depends about which is the other material that will make contact with. Because if it is aluminum, then the best thing will be uh, to have a EMC gasket made of aluminum. If it is something nearby, beryllium or copper, then it, it will have a it has to be a beryllium okay. copper gasket. Okay, I think we do two more questions, maybe, mm -hmm. because I think we're running out of time, right? Um, mm -hmm. So um, there's one question, is it better to connect the shield to ground plane, high impedance or low impedance? Um, so in this case where, uh, where I showed you for the single pair Ethernet board, or if you use this as an RJ45 Ethernet connector, um, the best way is to uh, hardly connect the shield to ground. The question is, if are you allowed to do this uh, in your final application? Um, because here we can get problems because we don't have a galvanic isolation. Uh, in this case, we have to think of the frequency which we want to return with the shield of this cable to the PCB. And then we can add capacitors. So we have a galvanic isolation, but we have an RF connection from shield to ground plane. So this depends from the application. Um, but uh, the best way is to directly connect it to the ground plane if we want to return something over the shield. And the last qu question is, with an unshielded cable, where should a ferrite be located? So um, when we go think of the shielded box where I put the laboratory cable inside, um, the ferrite should be placed at a point where we leave or enter the shielded box directly at a feed-through. The best way is to use a feed-through filter that is directly connected on the shield. Um, and I think we had one question to yesterday's presentations. Maybe uh, uh, the guys from the marketing department can answer where you can find it. I think this was a presentation from Lee Hill. I'm very sorry, but there's no recording possible. Um, okay. Just a live session. Okay. So, but I think we can uh, finish the, present, um, the question time because it's time to end the session. Um, there, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed our presentation. Um, just let me show my screen and you can see the next presentation topic, which starts at 10.30. It's UK conformity assessed mark EMC in UK after Brexit. So hopefully see you there and enjoy the EMC digital days. Goodbye. So goodbye. Take care. See you soon. Ciao.